everyone. In just a second, I'm going to be introducing author Barbara Claypole White, and she has written four or five books, but her newest book that just came out in January is called The Promise Between Us, and I love this book so much. What a great book. So anyway, I can't wait to talk to her, and we will talk afterwards. Here is Barbara. <laughs> Everyone, I am so excited today to be speaking with author Barbara Claypole White, and there is her newest book. Just came out in January. This promise between us, uh, Barbara. <laughs> like I said, this book is so good. Not only does it tackle issues that I didn't even understand. I mean, the story itself is so good as a mom, and you know, just. I'm, I'm sure it has touched so many people that you've heard from, but um, everyone's book, it covers OCD, OCD. And I was like, am I saying this correctly? Yes. And, and, and I, you know, I, I don't even, I didn't even know that I really struggled with OCD till I read this book, but I am so glad that you put it out there because it is something that people don't really talk about. We just think it's this weird thing that we do, but, I wanted to start off in telling you, because this kind of relates to the book, is that um, when my youngest son, now I have six children, okay? My youngest oh, son was born it. in oh. two, 2003, right? So mm -hmm. uh, my oldest son was 16, and then I had every age in between, okay? And then my ba and then a baby, right? So I'm dealing with his crap, his teenage crap, and he's watching this, so he knows. He's 30 now. <laughs> And you know what I mean? Like I'm dealing with him and then every one of them down. And then, I, so I have a baby, right? And mm -hmm. I'm one of those that like, I stayed at home and I looked like I had it all together. Like I can do this. I can do this, right? Mm -hmm. And we had this banister that the drop was like an eight to 10 foot drop, right? So you'd walk up the stairs and there'd be this banister. It was a high ceiling or whatever. So I would be carrying the baby up the steps and all of a sudden I was like, what if I dropped the baby over the bed? Like, what if I wasn't paying it? What if I tripped? What if I, like, and all of a sudden these thoughts kept going through. And I, so when I, so when I started reading this and realized like in the very beginning, she has this thought pattern and then I would be like, no, no, what? Like, what? Where did that thought come from? I'm just doing laundry. Okay. Like, where is this coming from? And so I do think that it was a little bit postpartum involved because it was a little baby, you know, because it was a tiny newborn or whatever, but, but it was like, I didn't tell anybody. Wow. I didn't know what that was. I didn't say. Well, and you know, you know, the interesting thing is that postpartum OCD doesn't just affect mothers. It also affects fathers and grandparents. Right. I know. Yeah. So it's, you know, like, I did not know. I did not know. Yeah, so when you when you brought it up, and then, you know, I everybody jokes. Okay, I have to say that now it's like this joke. Oh, I have OCD. Oh, I do this. Oh, I do, you know, oh, my OCD's acting up or something. And it makes it kind of like a joke. But for somebody who's really struggling with that thought pattern, because, you know, like I could, like her in the beginning, like I could just shove it away and just be like, that's a stupid thought. I'm doing laundry. Why am I thinking about that? You know, or giving the baby a bath. Oh, my God, what if I turn around and then I don't? And then I'm like, what am I talking about? Like, and you're like talk, you have this inner talk like she does and you're having this inner battle and I'm like, who am I talking to? I'm talking to the me that's thinking this weird, horrible thought yeah. that, you know. I mean, that's it. That's a, I think for me, the heartbreaking thing about OCD, you know, I live with it as a mother and, and as a wife and I suspect actually with, in hindsight, I live with it as a daughter. The thing is that, you know, most people focus on the compulsive behaviors, right. such as washing, and that is how it manifests for lots right. of people. But for lots of other people, it's purely mental. I mean, and it is for my son. And the thing is that, you know, we all have unwanted thoughts. Everyone has unwanted thoughts. I was out driving the other day on the ice, and this big ass pickup truck comes towards me, and it's going, you know, all over the place. And I think, oh my goodness, what if? What if it hit me? And, of course, it didn't, and we kept, you know, I kept on going, he kept on going, and the thought went. But with the OCD brain, that little what-if thought is going to keep building and building and building, and OCD is going to keep going, what if, what if, what if, what if, until it gets to, you know, your worst-case scenario. 
And, and then you get to get trapped in this loop of intrusive, repetitive, obsessive, unwanted thoughts. And what people don't realize is when they make jokes about, oh, I wish I was at so OCD, you know, I wish it would just, I, right. it would help me organize my, my underwear drawer or something, or my sock drawer. But, you know, it, it's hell. I mean, you're living with, with crippling anxiety. You know, my son wakes up anxious. He's, he goes to sleep anxious, you know, anxiety frames his life. And I think the sad thing is that for, for a lot of people, especially, you know, new parents struggling with postpartum OCD, it's so easily hidden because nobody else can see that private horror movie that's playing in your head. No one else can see those intrusive thoughts. And, and the sad thing is that you can have pretty severe OCD and fake it really well. I mean, if you're watching someone who's anxious and you're really paying attention, you can tell. I mean, I know when my son's anxious, I, you know, I can see it and his smile doesn't quite go all the way up. Right. You know, he'll start fidgeting like Katie, he will pick, yeah, and he'll go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and he starts moving a lot. And I mean, you know, you know when, you know, someone you love is anxious, but still it's so easy to dismiss that and not realize that they're actually battling a chronic illness. Yeah, and you know, we Oh, um, postpartum depression, okay, you know, had gotten a name back when I had my last son. It, you know, more people were in movie stars and people were talking about it. And yeah. I remember saying to myself, I'm not depressed. I'm not yeah. depressed, you know. So I don't have postpartum depression because I'm not, de I'm not sitting in bed crying. I'm not, you know, I'm functioning. I'm taking care of all these children. I'm, you know, making them breakfast, lunch, and dinner, doing all the laundry. Like, so I looked at myself like depressed means laying in bed, you know, depressed or crying. I wasn't crying. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't manifesting in that way. So that's why when I started, with you, I was like, oh my God, I never told anybody. Like that is exactly. And then as a mom, like, so you go on this ride, and I don't want to. I'm trying to think about how to talk about this book without giving any of it away because <laughs> because I don't want to give. You know, I want everybody to read it because it's so good. But it's like you know, I don't. I I look at Amazon just to see the reviews and see like, okay, that's as far as I can talk to. But you know, she she decides that you know her intrusive thoughts that she really gets afraid of taking care of her daughter. And so like any good mother, we're like, we can't, I can't do this. And, and you're only thinking of that child because you're not thinking of yourself. And, and of course, her, oh. yeah, her, yeah, the dad wasn't having any of it and didn't understand. And, and it's hard to explain to somebody who doesn't get it, you know, who doesn't have it to, you know, well, what's the, the thing is that, um, you know, if you, in the prologue, I mean, I can talk about the prologue. So yes, you can. Prologue in the prologue. <laughs> But um, so, you know, Katie has, Kate in the shoes then has, you know, been alone for a couple of days with these horrendous thoughts. She hasn't slept. Uh, she's anxious. You know, her husband comes back from a conference and she's going to tell him. She has finally decided to tell him, I, I can't do this anymore. I need help. She's decided to reach out for help. And of course, because she's anxious and sleep deprived and it's late at night, and he's exhausted because he's been traveling, he's been at a conference, comes out wrong and he overreacts because... Even though, even though Callum has his own issues with anxiety, not OCD that come out later in the novel, you know, if your wife, had, who had been alone with your baby for a couple of days, said, oh, my goodness, I'm having these awful thoughts of doing bad things to your baby, of course you're going to freak out. Right. So I understand how it all happens and how it all spirals. And then, you know, I think for me, really, the, the idea of the book was I love the idea that good people can get trapped trapped in really bad decisions that they actually make for good reasons. I mean, they both just loved Maisie and wanted to right. keep Maisie safe, as did the secondary characters, but they all made really bad decisions. They all screwed up along the way, you know, individually and collectively. Yeah. And I kind of love that. So. Oh, I love that too. I mean, I, this, <laughs> this book was so layered, you know, but every little bit that came out, it was just like, I wish I would have known so long ago, you know, like, because I, I had always suffered with anxiety, always. I mean, that could define my life if somebody were to be like, how do you define your life? I was always an anxious person, you know, and I think anybody who doesn't understand, you know, who's never had it doesn't understand that it can define, you know, that it is, and, you know, and people will ask me even now because I went through bad anxiety, right? And then I kind of came out of that and now I live with this just mild 
crazy. Yeah. And, you know, when people say, well, what, you know, how do you deal with that? It's like, oh my God, this is so much better. I'll take this anxiety over that, you know, but normal people are like, they get a little bit of anxiety and I'm like, that isn't even, I don't know, on my, my scale but, is so, you know, weird. Right. I mean, I had, before my very first book launch, The Unfinished Garden, which I've got down here on my floor because I have to send Yay. the book. Um, hang on, hang on. Yes, yes, <laughs> show it. Yeah, the unfinished garden. I was so anxious for book launch um, that you know I couldn't, I couldn't sleep, and I would go to sleep with like anxiety, you know, so clawing in my chest, and I, I would wake up with it, and I would, I would feel it in my hands like this. And one day I said to my son, "How do you do this?" I said, "I can't keep doing this. It's, it's just driving me completely loopy." And he just looked at me and he said, "Well." Welcome to my life, you know. It's true. It's and um, so that was, that for me was the real eye opener. And I, I, the interesting thing is I know I'm wired for OCD. I had two very specific OCD fears as a teenager that I didn't even clock as OCD until a few years ago. And, you know, I've been dealing with my son's OCD, living with it for, you know, nearly 20 years. And, and it was only recently I thought, oh, my goodness. Those were two very, very specific OCD fears. Now I don't know why I never developed full blown OCD, but I know I'm I know I'm wired for it. And I think you know, I mean I'm I'm fascinated by genetics and where this comes from and whether it's environmental or whether it's you know hereditary and, and I don't know. I know that there are specific triggers. And 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 I also know from you know my 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 journey with my son but exposure therapy, you know, learning to face your irrational fears does work. It's heartbreaking. It's painful. I hate doing it with my son. I always feel like I'm the worst mother ever, you know, for making him face his fears. But it does work. It does work. But, I, you know, and I think one of the, what maybe one of the reasons that I never de developed full-blown OCD is that my life sort of accidentally has been one long exposure, you know, to everything that frightened me. So I kind of did it without realizing, you know, I was a homebody. I was the classic anxious child, separation anxiety. I went a long way away to college. Well, you know, in English, English yes. terms, a long way away to college. Yes. I went outside my comfort zone of everything I knew. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I was cripplingly shy. I ended up in the London fashion industry as a publicist, which was all front person, front person, front person. And, you know, and then I fell in love with an American professor I met at JFK Airport and ended up <laughs> leaving everything to go and live in the Midwest as a faculty wow. spouse, you know, Great. with a degree in medieval history and work experience in the in English fashion industry. So everything has always been outside my comfort zone. And I think maybe that's the reason yeah. that I've, but, I, but, you know, who's to say that it couldn't, you know, the right trigger couldn't set it off? I don't know. I know. And I do agree with, um, cause I remember I had developed a, um, I don't even know what you call it. Anxiety over driving. Okay. Which is yes. common. Okay. It's common. It's common too. <laughs> right. It's, it's common, but I really like had this anxiety and I had these children that needed to go places. And finally mm. one day, you know, I would kind of manipulate my way around not having to drive places but one day I was like you know what this is so ridiculous I love driving like inside my head I'm going but you love to drive what are you doing and mm -hmm. so I just went out I you know I, I said to my kids like I'm, I need to go drive you know and they're like what I'm like I'm just I need you know half an hour I'll be right back went on the freeway drove came back wow. and I was like it's done so I do know that that does you know like I did it and I do think but I still like second floors of malls yeah. oh my god the wrong kind of banister or something or it shakes or something i'm like that's, ah! that's the other thing is that even if you can face one of your ocd fears oh yeah and ocd is it is like it's a mushroom like pill. Another one. it, it another keeps one. popping up you know and it can it can latch onto anything it can catch you unawares and it's exhausting I and mean, you get one ocd fear stomped down and something else comes up and and, you know, it, it is a, as Katie says, it is a scattershot of obsessions. And right. sometimes you just, you know, you can't do it sometimes. And, and you know, the, the one thing that I've learned as a mom is that, you know, because I used to push my son really hard in therapy when he was younger, push him to do exposures. And I pushed too hard a couple of times. And I learned, my journey was to learn, 
that it's okay to fail. And you know, you can't you can't face every fear every day. You know, you just do the best you can to keep on trucking. And some days when you can't manage, it's okay to do what Katie does and just crawl up on the bathroom floor and let Ben. Oh, spoiler, spoiler, no! They won't get it. They won't get it. But you know, I I know what you mean as a mom because my oldest son. I remember one time, so, you know, I'm dealing with anxiety and you think that when you're dealing with it, your children aren't really paying attention. I mean, I thought that I covered it up pretty well, but one time my son was waiting for me somewhere and I was late. Okay. And he was young. He was like eight or something. And I remember I got there and he was pacing and pacing. And I was like, I'm here. And he was like, but I thought you weren't going to get here. And it like took him. And I was like watching him and I was like, oh no oh no, he hasn't like that built up anxiety in him because I was late and Mm -hmm. you know, and he's 30 and he's going to be editing this now. And he will tell you, you know, he was in the military, you know, he faced a lot of anxiety, but I know he has anxiety that he deals with. And, and I felt bad because I did feel like, oh no, did he get it from watching me? Like, is it my mannerisms or is it genetic? You know, you just, I don't Mm -hmm. know. I don't know if we know, but I I understand like when you watched your son, cause you're like, it's okay if I can deal with, you know, I'll deal with it. Right. Wow. But then you watch a child all of a sudden be anxious and you're like, oh, no, like, uh, I don't want him to be anxious. You know, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, sometimes the only thing that you can do as a mom is just really, really is just hold your child and and just say it's OK. You know, we'll get through this together. And, and I think the important thing always for me as someone who is sort of outside the OCD loop in the family right. is to not never judge, you know, the guy, my guys because of their illness. I mean, that's empowering to me. That's why I love that we have a diagnosis that yeah. you can say, okay, that, that's not you. That's your OCD, you know, okay. and, and it's sort of like putting it in the box and right. taking away its power. Right. I mean, it is, it is, it does come back to, you know, Katie talking about Harry Potter and Harry, you know, referring to Voldemort as Voldemort and not he who shall not be named. Because naming Voldemort takes away some of his power. Yes. So that's, you know, it's the same thing with OCD. It's OCD. That's the first thing, you know, we ever looked in therapy, yeah. label it, you know. Yeah. Label your monster. Right, and that's true, right. And I have a favorite quote, okay. And oh, I, mean, yeah, I, I, love I know, and I don't know. I, usually I look them up, but I didn't look this up to see. I usually go on Goodreads to see how many people get the quotes that I get. And then I get mad if they do, and then I get mad if they don't. <laughs> so it's a no-win situation for me. Because <laughs> sometimes I'm like, I want it to be just the one I like. But then other times I'm like, why didn't anybody else see this? I what have, Why did I see it? <laughs> So I I love, and she says this, this isn't just the first time she says it. She does say it in different ways a lot, um, Katie, when she says, a thought is just a thought, not an action. It yeah. can't hurt anyone. It yeah. has no power. Because I want, you know, I wish I would have had that. And I'm going to use it. I am definitely going to it's use brilliant. it. It's brilliant. You know, I use it. It's actually, it's something that I learned from, this wonderful woman, Angie Alexander, who's quoted in the front of the book, who battled with postpartum OCD for 14 years. She's an incredible activist. She does all kinds of advocacy work, and she's set up you know, several different OCD support groups. And that was something that I learned from her. And as soon as she said it, I thought, oh, my goodness. So I actually was texting my son, because he was still at college then, saying, oh, my goodness, this is so brilliant. We have to start saying this. And... You know, whenever I feel myself getting kind of like twitchy with anger or anxiety or just something that I can't really control, I just take a deep breath and I say, a thought is just a thought. It has no power. And that, that is, that is a, you. You yeah, know? it's it brilliant. Just like so accept, I'm afraid right? it's not original. <laughs> well, I loved it. I mean, she, like I said, it was used throughout the book, but it meant so much to me because yeah. I know that I could just say it and have all of a sudden just, it, it kind of just take that moment and say that to yourself, that it's just a thought. It's not, yeah. it's not anything, just you know, any, anything that you can say that takes you out of that loop, loop of that thinking. endless loop. Yes. You know? Yes, absolutely. Well, and you want to know something when well, years, years back, like, I don't know, back in two. 2002 or something like that I had bought a program from an English guy that was out there like I can cure anxiety 
And at the time, it was like discs or something, you know, some DVDs or something. And I went through them, and they were actually pretty good. And it was about facing it and stopping the loop, you know, like like that sentence. And he gave different sentences. And it did really help me because I didn't realize that my brain was on a loop. And I think that's for people who don't understand OCD. It's not just a thought. It's a thought that has a thought that has a thought. And, you know, and if if you can't, you got to catch it early on. You know? And it spreads. I mean, it, it grows multiple branches. It starts in one tiny little seed and it just... And then all you of a sudden your breathing spread. becomes shallow. You start sweating. I mean, then the physical takes on. It starts as a thought, but then the physical takes on. Absolutely. And, you know, That's so it cool. all starts right here. <laughs> like, right. And, you know, and my son's... I mean, our journey with my son's anxiety yeah. is that he had a lot of stomach problems and headaches as a child. And then he, then he had sleep issues. And, you know, his pediatrician and the first psychologist we saw, they were all trying to figure out what was going him going on with him, but they were thinking about medical stuff and, you know, whether he was like maybe a celiac or he had Crohn's right. disease or whatever. And I took him to a holistic doctor who took one look at him and said, you know what, what's your son? He's anxious. And I was going, oh, my goodness, yes. I never thought before that, you know, anxiety could manifest yeah. in physical symptoms, and it does. It does really does yeah Yeah. and this so I saw that somebody on Amazon had said that you used I didn't read your other books but that there were it was there a character or a reference to a character or do your books relate in any way like that because I know this is like your fifth book I think yeah they're all standalones okay so they're all standalones okay they're all standalones but um I you know I write what I call hopeful family drama with a healthy dose of mental illness and that comes from my very first hero, James, in the Unfinished Garden, okay. who had um, has obsessive compulsive disorder. And he came from my darkest fear as a mother, which was what if, when my young son grew up, no one could see beyond his quirky behavior and his anxiety to love him for the incredible person he is. So ever since James, I've wanted to revisit OCD. So there is there is some OCD in, in this book. Okay. Um, because of you know, I go into James's head, and I do talk about the voice. Um, and, but this is sort of this is the uh, that novel like, yeah, alleged okay. this, but all the characters are completely completely separate. But I do tend to use um, settings that are local. I live in the Triangle in North Carolina, or I use settings that are back in Southern England near the village where I was born, where my mother still lives. Oh. So I often have like an English. If I don't have an English scene or if the story doesn't go to England at some point I weave in an English character because so this is why Callum and Maisie are Scottish <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking what am I going to do because my mother once um on my second novel my mother's comment on my second novel was well Barbara you don't have anybody English in it and I actually did but he was a very secondary character um so yeah so I kind of you know I had the Scottish thing going <laughs> I promise you oh. You know, and I'm half English, and I've oh. always wanted to go to England. I've never been there. And, like, I I don't know. I, I live in Pennsylvania, and I'm half Pennsylvania Dutch, but I'm half English. And oh. my English family didn't – they came in the 1900s, so it was kind of, like, later on, considering how far back some people have come. But I've always, like, wanted to go there because we have a coat of arms from England. And, like, I want to go back. I want to go there. I think I'll relate. I feel like whenever I, you know, when I watch, like, I've always been obsessed with royalty. Like, you know, it was Princess Di and then, you know, Kate. I'm really excited about the royal wedding. Oh, my God. I know. I get, and then I'm like, is that my, is that my, in my genes? Because I'm, like, half English that they just excite me so much. Yeah. Well, you know, I actually, I saw Princess Diana a couple of times. Um, yeah, and it, you know that's that's still a memory that I that I hold very dear. Wow. Yeah, and I mean I connected with her on you know I was young you know it was the eighties but her story and her you know and she was like such a fashion icon back then. But so that's it. She was like the ambassador of the oh. British fashion industry when you know and so. It was kind of amazing because that was the moment that the British fashion industry took off and I was working in it. Um, oh, you were? oh, is that how you met her? Is that how you saw yeah, her? Well, I didn't meet her. I, she I opened. Her. She, I worked the first ever British designer show. It was a trade show. And and she was the celebrity that opened the show, but we didn't know she was coming. And so we were in this exhibition hall in Olympia and there was all this buzz. 
it's going to be, it's going to be the princess. She's you know she's going to open Olympia, and so we all kind of went to the balcony, and there was these this line of black cars came up with a royal standard. It gives me goosebumps talking about it. I, I'm getting goosebumps. Go ahead, keep going. She she got out of the car and. She was wearing uh, my client's uh, clothes. I, I used to work for Maxwell Parish. She was wearing pink Maxwell Parish suede, and which we didn't know about. I mean, I don't know how we didn't know, but we didn't know about that. And I guess it had been a secret or something, and that the worker bees weren't told. But um, she stepped out of the car, and she was surrounded by men in black, but she was like a head taller than all of them. She had this incredible blonde hair. And the entire exhibition hall went absolutely silent, and we all just watched her. And it was just... You know, and I think about that moment so much. And then I think about, you know, the other time I saw it was when she, um, you know, famously shook hands with an AIDS, AIDS patient at the Middlesex Hospital in London. Yeah. And I got down the road from the Middlesex and, you know, heard on the news she was going to be there. So I just went in my lunch hour and I happened to see her come out. And I think about that. And then I always think about, you know, whenever I'm watching her incredible sons doing all the good work that they do for mental illness, they have done so much recently. Mm-hmm to yeah. chip away at the stigma and the shame. I just, I love it. It's like it's come full circle. Um, yeah, I think yeah. she left such an example for them. And mm-hmm. she was kind of the first one to be so outward about her thing, you know, when she would go to hospitals and, you know, yeah. I don't know. I, I, that's just what I saw, you know. It's like she was mm-hmm. just so out there. And uh, I, I follow this person on Instagram who's like, you know, princess die addicted or something, but every day pictures of her with different, and I'm like, I remember that outfit. I remember that outfit. I know. I know. Because <laughs> she was like, about the outfit. Yes, you know? I know. I used to, I, I actually still have like old newspaper articles and magazine, you know, features with her when they did all her photo shoots and everything. And she was a, I just, she was a fascinating Stunning. lady. Stunning. Yeah. Well, that is so She did cool. a lot of good in the world. And so does Prince Charles. People don't always realize that he does too. I mean, I, I mean, the royal family do a lot of good work. Well, you know, I have a daughter who's a redhead and she's 23. <laughs> And she used to always say to me about Prince Prince Harry, she'd say, well, we're half English, so if I met him, I could marry him, right? Because we are half. And, of course, now he's not marrying somebody who's English, but she thought he had to be English to be royalty. But, you know. So. <laughs> she thought they'd make such a cute couple because they both have red hair. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, you put out, okay, let's just talk about your books before we get going because I could talk to you for. <laughs> I could talk to you. Let's talk about Princess Di. I know, let's we'll just talk about Princess Di. But anyway, your books have been coming out yearly since The Perfect Son, then Echoes of Family, then this one. Are you, is that what your goal is now? Are you doing a book a year? Are you under contract oh, for that? Yeah, I'm, I'm meant to be a book a year. I mean, when you write sort of upmarket women's fiction, book club fiction, which is what I do, you're meant to be a book a year. I'm actually not. I'm one every 15 months. People think I'm more productive than I am. I'm very slow. Um, I am doing this full time, but I'm very slow. I have a high maintenance family. We have two aging parents. I'm the sandwich generation. Yeah. I do a lot of research. And, and because I kind of go down the rabbit hole with my characters, I'm all about the characters and finding oh, yeah. the character's voice. But I can't, I literally cannot start a new manuscript until the one I'm working on is completely and utterly done, as in page proofs done, which really slows me down. I've tried to, you know, speed up my process and I can't. I just, you know, I I have this horrible sloppy process and and it sort of works for me, so I'm kind of going to stick with it. Um, Yeah, I'm actually going a little bit more slowly with the new one um, because I'm actually off contract for the first time in six years, which is kind of nice. It's just giving me time to just kind of find my way with the story. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to keep doing what I do, keep keep writing my my weird, quirky little stories my way. Um, And um, so, yes, I mean, I I would like to – you know, I did at one point hope that I could speed up and do a book a year, but I, but 15 months just seems to be my sweet spot. So I'm just yeah. going to stick with it. <laughs> well, and you know what? It's still so inspiring to me as a woman, because when you are doing so many things, I mean, I always, when, when I talk to women authors that are like, you know, I'm editing a book and then I'm writing a book and then I'm researching my next book and I'm like, oh my gosh, my brain. And I have three children on the five. I'm like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> I'm not productive. <laughs> I know, like, I 
get up at four o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I, yeah, I can't do that. I, I don't know. Like, Wait, miracle- I get up at six. I get up at six. You get up at six. Right. Exactly. It's more yeah. normal. It's normal. Well, I, I couldn't, I know I have friends who get up at three and four and bless them. I couldn't do it. So no, I mean, you know, you, you find what works for you exactly. and what works uh, for your family. And that's what's what important. Works your family. Yeah. That's what I think is important. That's why it's still so inspiring because it takes a lot to get through a book and, and the book edits and everything. I mean, this book is tight. I love reading a really tight book that every sentence, every chapter, every paragraph, you know, I don't want to miss any of it because it's so well written. And I know that takes time. So, you know, as, as a reader, we appreciate that. So. <laughs> That's six months right there. <laughs> that's, six months. that's what I'm talking about, right? Isn't that I mean, that's my extra, you know, my extra three months or whatever on the top of the yearly. Yeah, but yeah. you can no. really tell when that happens because I read a lot of books and I can tell when a book has not been edited enough. And, you know, this book was amazing. I love I love this story. And I'm so happy you brought this topic up. And show everybody that cover one more time because I love this cover and everybody will understand when they read it. <laughs> Why this cover? Because <laughs> it's little Maisie. I love that. Little Maisie. Yeah, little Maisie doing her pirouettes. Pirouettes. Yes. And, you know, North Carolina forest in the background. Yeah, exactly. I know. That's when, when I wrote it down. I went to write South Carolina. I was like, no, she's in North Carolina. You know, because. Well, I, I should tell you something else. This is actually quite an important image up here. This is my favorite writing image is light through the trees. Because. Oh. You know, my, you know, there aren't always happy endings when you're talking about mental illness, but there's always hope. Yeah. And light through the trees is my image for hope. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Barbara. I was so excited when you said yes. It was like every once in a while I get one of those like, oh, yes, yes, yes. I get to meet Barbara. <laughs> I was so happy. And I'm, I feel so blessed that your book is out there and, and it opens up a lot of topic for everyone. And, you know. So anyway, let me know when your next book comes out. We'll chat. I certainly will. Thank you. I Thank will have you. all of Barbara's links underneath here, and you can find her everywhere. And, uh, and I'll have your Amazon link, too. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. was amazing. I could have talked to her forever. I really, I kept looking at the clock thinking, no, I don't want it to end. She was so awesome. And I'm so happy she wrote this book on OCD. I really am. And I was about to say ADSD because there's all these ADD, ODCD, but OCD is so important because I wish I would have known sooner that, um, you know, what the symptoms were and, you know, she's bringing it out to light and, and this book is crazy good. You're going to love these characters. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you for talking with me. All of Barbara's links will be listed under here. Thank you for watching this video. And if you liked it, hit like. If you'd like to see my videos that I post every day, but Sunday hit subscribe and, um, thanks for watching.